Hi, today we're going to talk a little bit about circuit training. Circuit training is a type of training that links together a series of exercises between four to ten different exercises and introduces a short rest, a brief rest, in between each exercise as they're all done in a circuit. Now, circuit training um, is good for uh, muscle endurance, muscle strength, and cardiovascular fitness. It combines all of these together, uh, which makes it a great way to train. You get uh, maximum benefit, overall body fitness, because you've linked together these four to ten exercises with brief rest, high intensity, and it builds power, strength, endurance, and because it's done rapidly with brief periods of rest between uh, cardiovascular health as well. So one of its greatest positive benefits of circuit training is its versatility. It can be uh, shaped or put together to emphasize uh, one type of benefit over another. For example, uh, a power-based circuit would basically emphasize short time periods of doing the exercise, longer rests between exercises, but once again done with high intensity. So short duration of the exercise, longer rest periods, high intensity, you build power. If you want to do an endurance based a circuit, then what you would do is have longer time periods of engaging in the exercise, shorter rest periods in between, but the same high intensity. And the high intensity is what makes the circuit training beneficial. So uh, it's versatile. It can be tweaked or shaped to either build power or endurance. It promotes overall health, muscle endurance, uh, muscle strength and cardiovascular fitness. And it's linking together in a series uh, between four and ten different exercises usually involving uh, the whole body or large muscle groups in the body. If you'd like to learn more about circuit training and things related to it, there's a link beneath this video. Click on it, it'll take you to a website where you can find out more and at that website you'll also find an ebook ready for immediate download. We are going to talk about the actions of muscles. The main actions that muscles take are isometric, isokinetic, and isotonic. Isometric action is a stable, unmoving action of the muscle. It is a static exercise, meaning the muscle and the joint does not move and the muscle does not change length. Isometric exercise can strengthen the muscle, but only in the position that the exercise was held. Isokinetic exercises require um, a machine. It's a motion that's made on a machine that controls the speed and the force of the movement. Isotonic or dynamic action moves the muscle visibly. It is a motion um, most often associated with standard muscle training. It can be broken down into two phases. The concentric phase, which is the positive contraction, uh, which is usually the lifting action. It uh, is working against resistance, and this causes a shortening of the muscle. The eccentric phase is the negative contraction, which causes the lengthening. It is typically the extension phase of the exercise. So the muscles can perform isometric or static exercise isokinetic action requiring a machine to control the speed and the force of the movement or isotonic which is the actual movement of the muscle and joint uh, typically referred to in standard muscle training. Today we want to briefly go over assisting touch, how touch can help in therapy and helping others, specific touches and holds to um, teach and instruct people as you're seeking to help them. So I'm just going to go over these that I've got here on the board briefly. When we think about a maintained touch, this is a touch that is used to help a person, uh, you're using your hand, either holding their hand or uh, touching an appropriate place of their body to help them maintain or hold a position. It's called maintained touch. So at that point you're using your hand on their hand or an appropriate body part to say, hold this position, don't move. A palpation touch is a soft touch of your fingertips, usually showing which muscle group is being worked. Um, it's gentle and uh, not um, 
forceful or direct, but sort of a gentle touch showing, hey, this is the muscle group that's being worked here. The knife edge touch has to do with this edge of your hand here as you drag it down a particular uh, muscle group of the body showing which way the um, muscle is contracting. So you're trying to educate and teach and you use the edge of your hand saying the muscle contract this way or that way. And then finally when we talk about assisting touch, there's the move away and move towards touch which has to do with uh, getting the person to retreat from, that's the move away, or move in the direction of your hand. Uh, so once again, touch can be uh, a great assistant for you in helping people, in education, in therapy, in uh, rehabilitation, in all those ways. So the maintain touch, hand on hand, hand to appropriate body part, hold this position, don't move, the palpation, uh, soft, gentle touch, uh, appropriately on the muscle group, showing which muscle is being worked, the knife edge of the hand draw, uh, dragged along the part where the muscle is uh, contracting to illustrate where that's happening, and the move away and move towards touch or a hand gesture related to letting the person know to move away from, retreat from, or move in the direction of uh, your hand. So this has just been a brief overview of various types of assistive touch. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll see a link. If you'll click on that link, it'll take you to the website that has an information, and while you're at that website, you'll also find a link to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Today we're just going to go over uh, just a few of the uh, basic facts related to skill fitness. How you can tell what level someone has in a particular skill, how fit they are. And it, it can be broken down into six categories and just want to briefly go over those categories so that uh, as you're thinking about skill fitness you'll know what to be looking for. So first when we think about someone's skill fitness level we need to think about agility. agility. Agility is the ability to change body position rapidly and to maintain uh, control over your body movements. Someone who has high agility can rapidly change body position and has a high degree of control over their body's motion or movements. When we think of agility, we tend to think of people like gymnasts, these sorts of things. They have a high degree of control over their body movements as well as the ability to change their body position rapidly. Along with agility, we have balance, and this is the ability to stay upright while moving or standing. And once again, we might think of a gymnast on a balance beam here. Their ability to remain balanced, to stay upright while moving or standing. Uh, after balance, we have coordination, and coordination has to do with the uh, relatedness or connectedness between what the sense information coming in from the eyes or the ears or other senses as it relates to the body's movement. And we talk about good hand-eye coordination, uh, good foot-eye coordination. So a soccer player uh, would obviously need good foot-eye coordination. As the ball is coming in, they have to coordinate body movement to meet the ball with the feet and send it where they want it to go. Uh, same with perhaps a baseball player with good hand-eye coordination looking to hit a pitch as it comes in. The eye is receiving the information and they're able to coordinate body movement related to that sensory information that's coming in. Next, power. Uh, someone's skill fitness is related to their strength plus their speed. Strength uh, plus speed is the uh, way we come up with power. Uh, someone can be fast and not very powerful. They can also be strong and not necessarily powerful, but strength plus speed equals power. Um, when we think about this, you might think about what's necessary in terms of a baseball player hitting a home run. They need to be strong and fast in order to connect with the pitch that's coming in and send it over the fence. Next, we think reaction time. Reaction time is the length of time between uh, when the signal is given, whatever that is, visual or uh, audible, and how long it takes the men to respond to that stimulus, that external um, mechanism that says, hey, start. So the reaction time then is the start time after the signal is received. Here you can think maybe of uh, a sprinter down uh, waiting for the sound of the uh, signal gun to go off and then to immediately after that sound leap from the line and sprint down the lane. So start time is the amount of time it takes from uh, when they hear the signal to the body's beginning motion. And then finally speed. Remember we said power is strength plus speed. Speed is the ability to perform a motion or to cover a distance in a very short, spirit, uh, short period of time, short span of time. Um, 
the motion uh, speed, we might think here of a boxer's ability to throw a quick punch or jab, and then covering distance in a short time span would once again be the, the sprinter or the football player uh, getting his time on his uh, 40 and that sort of thing. So speed is the ability to perform a motion or to cover distance in a short time span. Well, anyway, these are the six skill fitness categories, agility, balance, coordination, power, reaction time, and speed. And where you fall in all these categories would be the level uh, of your skill fitness. And of course, as you evaluate this, you can find areas perhaps where there's uh, areas to improve, weaknesses, and then you can focus on that particular category of skill fitness and try to improve their hand-eye coordination, their balance, their agility, um, their speed, things like this as you put together a training regimen for someone else or for yourself. This has been a, just a brief overview then of skill fitness and the six areas related to it. If you'd like to learn more about this or related matters, underneath this video you'll find a link. If you'll click on it, it'll take you to the website with that information. And while you're there, you'll find a link on that website to an ebook that's ready for immediate download. Stress. It's something that every human being goes through at one point in their life or another, often multiple times, and sometimes over a prolonged period. The universal human response to stress has been dubbed the General Adaptation Syndrome, or GAS for short. It has three stages. The General Adaptation Syndrome, or the GAS response to stress, has three stages. And we're going to go over those now. The first stage is called stimulation. At this stage the stress has been introduced to the person and their body responds by the hypothalamus stimulating the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine or adrenaline. Uh, epinephrine and adrenaline are the same thing depending on what part of the world you're in. They're going to favor one or the other. Epinephrine is the Greek derived word for this hormone and adrenaline is the Latin derived word for this hormone, but they're the same thing. So the hypothalamus stimulates the adrenal medulla and releases epinephrine. The glucose level rises, the heart and respiration rates increase, and the individual becomes alarmed. Uh, we've all experienced this. Stress comes in, things uh, heat up, adrenaline or epinephrine is released, heart rate goes up, resp respiration goes up, and the person is in a state of um, readiness, alarm, fight or flight in some ways. So uh, the gas response then is managed by the adrenal and the pituitary gland. So the first level then is stimulation. If the stress is not resolved at this level, then the second stage that the general adaptation syndrome goes to is resistance. At this stage, the body resists the stress by returning respiration and heart rates to baseline. The hypothalamus commands the pituitary gland to release ACTH, a hormone that causes the adrenal cortex to release cortisol. Uh, cortisol is a chemical that maintains high levels of blood glucose. So this is once again the body's attempt to deal with whatever is bringing about the stress. So stimulation puts a person in an alarmed or heightened state. It persists, resistance comes in, the body trying to bring things uh, into line into a normal state. Once again, uh, the hypothalamus um, is uh, critical to all this. In the initial stage, it stimulates the adrenal medulla to release epinephrine. In the next state, it commands the pituitary gland to release the hormone ACTH, which causes the adrenal cortex to release cortisol to keep the blood glucose levels high. Finally, if the stress is not resolved, the third stage for the general adaptation or gas syndrome is exhaustion. Here the pituitary and adrenal glands are utterly fatigued, the physiological processes start to break down, and it is this stage right here, this exhaustion stage, that if uh, it is prolonged is most damaging to health. So, uh, stress management is extremely important. Stress comes into everyone's life. The uh, universal response of every human being experiencing various levels of stress has been generalized as the gas adaptation or the general adaptation syndrome. It has three stages, stimulation, resistance, and then exhaustion, this stage being the most damaging to health. The hypothalamus involved in this. First stage, releasing epinephrine. Second stage, releasing ACTH. 
in order to get uh, cortisol to come out and raise the blood glucose levels. And then finally, when the pituitary and adrenal glands are utterly fatigued, uh, everything begins to break down and the health begins to deteriorate. If you'd like to read more and learn more about stress and uh, find out uh, exploration more in this area, then please click on the link beneath this video. It'll take you to a website where you can study further, and you'll also find an ebook there ready for immediate download.